Mel White was born into a conservative Christian home and educated in conservative Christian schools and churches. Throughout his youth, he was taught that homosexuality was evil and grew up believing that his own gay feelings were sinful. For 30 years, he fought his sexual orientation with prayer, counseling, electroshock, and exorcism. During this time, and in spite of his success as a best-selling author and prize-winning filmmaker, Mel White says he felt condemned by God and alienated from his family and closest friends. For 10 years, at the same time, he served as ghostwriter and film producer for leaders of the religious right, including such individuals as Billy Graham, Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, and Oliver North. At the time, they considered White one of their most loyal and devoted supporters. However, after the fall of communism, his clients turned to a new cause, the threat, as they saw it, presented by homosexuality in American society. For Mel White, it was time to make a matter of his private conscience one of public discussion. Now, Mel White, an avowed homosexual and minister of the nation's largest gay lesbian congregation, is telling his story, speaking to audiences around the country, and through his book published this past spring called Stranger at the Gate, to be gay and Christian in America. Dr. White is dean of the Cathedral of Hope Metropolitan Community Church in Dallas. He's also a former resident of Portland, having received his undergraduate degree from Warner Pacific College and an advanced degree in communications from the University of Portland. Dr. White returns to Portland today to share his views on the continuing debate over homosexuality and gay rights in Oregon, where he sees the state as a critical proving ground for these issues. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mel White to the City Club podium. My favorite line from this last election year was Dan Rather asking a person on the street, what's the biggest problem among voters? Is it ignorance or is it apathy? And this person said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> I am proud to be standing here before a group of people and broadcasting to Oregonians across this great state who both know and care about this issue and its importance to a large number, gay and straight alike, in your great state. What a treat it is to be here. And to get this rose from Mrs. Jackson, where did you steal it? <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? Only Portland. I moved to Pasadena, and they said, you know, we're the rose capital of the world. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I did enjoy my years of study here, 1958 through 1967. Yes, Marge, we did have bathrooms and electricity in those days. I, one of the things about Measure, nine, uh, measure 13 that bothers me the most is the very notion that, that anybody would suggest censoring books in this great city and across the state. I spent more time in the public libraries of this city and of Oregon when I was working here and studying here and the very thing, the, th this, the, the notion that anybody would vote for that, I'm just so convinced that 13 will go down in shambles that, that we'll never face that. But in the meantime, let's talk about it. Yesterday, Tom Bates at the Oregonian asked me a wonderful question. He said, compare the war, the Cold War, that, that waged, raged for so long with the war that's being raised by the radical right against gay and lesbian people. We talked for a while, and then I went home and I thought, I wish I'd said, they had the A-bomb, we had the May-bomb. <laughs> but fortunately, I didn't say it. I don't want to come here just to disparage Lon or Bon, may bon or members of the OCA. There are so many thousands of good people who are registered as supporters of the OCA who I think, like Lon, have simply been misled about this whole issue of homosexuality. How can I find fault with them when I was misled for so long myself? So in the same spirit of love, 
that I think Jesus taught his disciples when he said, this is the one command I leave you, that you love one another. That I want to be the spirit of today, not to build a bigger wall or a wider separation between us, but trying to bridge the gap of understanding. I noticed in the paper today that Lon didn't like me too much. He said he rejected the whole notion that I could be a gay Christian. It's an oxymoron, Lon said. You can't be Christian and advocate homosexuality. From God's perspective, homosexuality is a sin. Let's start there. I, after leaving Portland, went on to earn my doctorate and did postgraduate work at Harvard and at USC and UCLA. I had to learn Hebrew. I had to learn Greek. And then I went back to Fuller Seminary with my doctorate and taught for 14 years. I hate it when they say to me things like, have you ever read Leviticus 20? Um, yeah. <laughs> I have read it. I hope that Lon will at least immediately stop saying who is Christian and who isn't. Isn't that God's business? Aren't we to be judged by the lives we lead? I serve 12,000 gay and lesbian Christians in Dallas, Texas. Most of these young men and women have been kicked out of their homes and churches and have ended up without a place to call a home, a church home. Do you know how many kids we find dumped at our doorstep a month? who have simply told their parents that they think they might be lesbian or gay, and their parents drive up and dump them, discard them at our doors, with maybe some money, most of the time with none. And they knock on our door with fear and trembling, saying, my folks don't want me. Is there anybody who does? The kind of misinformation that you can't be gay and Christian is so damning. One out of three teenage suicides in this country is a teenage gay or lesbian. And there's the report by Secretary Sullivan that was immediately shelved by the Bush administration that we had to dig out through the Freedom of Information Act said simply that teenage lesbians and gays kill themselves more than any other form of death because they can't feel loved of God. They can't feel redeemed. When I wrote to be gay and Christian in America, Simon Schuster was even afraid to put that on the cover because they were so alarmed that no one would buy the book and take it out of the store without keeping it in a brown paper bag. Gary, how many letters are we getting a day now? 50 to 70 a day from gay and lesbian people across this country who said, no one has ever said to me before, you can be gay and Christian. No one has ever said to me before anything but judgment and intolerance and discrimination. Can we come to Texas to talk to you? Gary and I are going literally bonkers, trying simply to answer the letters. Thousands of them. We have 10 people in the cathedral just doing loving form letters back. And every time something like 60 Minutes comes on the air, thousands more. Lon, isn't it time we exploded this issue? Isn't it time we said to gay and lesbian Americans across this country, whether we agree with you or not, it's OK to come out of these dark, deep, dangerous closets and be a part of the American scene? Isn't it time we quit these untruths so that the suffering will slow, if not stop? I need some water. I don't get moved most of the time, but I'm in Portland now. <laughs> and I feel like I've come home. I'll tell you why. When you're in college and in graduate school, alone for the first time, you come to a strange city like this, and you get welcomed like I was welcomed. You get cared for like I was cared for, and you never forget it. What happened to Rose's delicatessen? Rose used to come over to my table, and on Yom Kippur we should celebrate Rose and the Jews in our life who've made such a difference, including Jesus. Rose used to come to my table and said, Mel, 
you, you haven't put enough butter on that cinnamon roll. <laughs> and she would dump literally four million carbohydrates or calories or whatever they are on that roll. I had lunch yesterday at Dan and Louie's Oyster Bar. And you know, Greg Jackson, who's lived here in the city, has never even ventured down to know about that. I spent more time trying to learn Hebrew and Greek in Dan and Louie's Oyster Bar. I love this place. That's why I moved by it. And that's why I would like to say to Lon, I don't hate you. And I certainly don't hate members of the OCA. I think you're sincere. I think you want desperately to do the right thing for the communities of this great state. But you have been misinformed about lesbian and gay life. And you know, it's all based on the biblical passages. When you scratch away any kind of anti-gay person, they get back down to Leviticus 20 and to Romans 1 and a few other. We call them clobber passages. They're the five or six passages in the Old and New Testament that are used to clobber gay and lesbian people. Lon, without any historic or linguistic notion of what these Hebrew and Greek terms mean, are taking an English translation and are using it to condemn millions of people back into the closet. There was no word for homosexual in Koine Greek or in the unpointed Hebrew text. The first time the word homosexual appeared in the Bible was in the 1950s in a translation by fundamentalists. The word homosexual does not appear in the ancient texts. And there was no concept in those days, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, about sexual orientation. There was no concept that men or women could be born or shaped in the earliest days of infancy for same-sex preference only, for same-sex orientation only. They could not know that. The biblical scholars do not speak to that. They condemn sexual acts like gang rape and temple prostitution and men using boys for sex acts. They condemn things that every gay and lesbian in America would or should condemn. But the Bible does not condemn homosexual orientation, nor does it condemn acts of intimacy between loving, committed gay and lesbian people in relationship. The Bible is quiet as Jesus was about this subject. Though surrounded by this kind of practice, in his entire lifetime we have not one word from Jesus on it. The Bible. And yet, I was on a talk show just a few months ago in Seattle where Reverend Andrews from a big Presbyterian church said to me again, have you ever read Leviticus 20? And I said, yes, what does it mean to you? And he said, it means this, it means you should be killed. And I said, are you telling me that because it says a man who sleeps with another man is an abomination worthy of death, in the context of those cleanliness passages where it says, if a child who sasses his parents, he too is worthy of death, a man who sleeps with a wife during her, her period is also worthy of death, you can't eat at Dan and Louie's oyster bar, you can't buy cotton and wool slacks from Meyer and Frank, all those things in that, do you mean to say that gay and lesbian people should be killed in that context? He said, yes. And I said, and this is over a 50,000 watt radio station. Who should do the killing? The churches? You people in the churches? He said, no. That's why we need more good men of God elected into government. That's why the Christian coalition is so important to us. I said, now, you mean they should kill us? He said, it's not easy for me to say that, Mel, but God said it first. That's the second thing I want to talk to you about. It comes, too, from Mr. Maybon. I said that Measure 9 is just being copied by Measure 13, and it's a license to kill, and it leads to just get rid of them mentality. And Lon said, that's absurd. I would challenge him to bring forward any responsible evangelical or Catholic who advocates people being killed. That rhetoric points to the, who the real extremists are in this debate. Okay? I take your challenge, Lon. I have before me a signature petition signed by at least five leading citizens of the city of Oregon, of Portland, 
that asserts that if Michael Griffin did in fact kill David Gunn, his use of lethal force was justifiable, provided it was carried out for the purpose of defending the lives of unborn children, therefore he ought to be acquitted of the charges against him. I have in my hand the m manual for the National Christian Militia that tells you the machine guns you should buy and the rifles you should practice on and uses Jesus over and over, misuses Jesus over and over to say why we need to take back this government by force if and when it goes on and continues to do these kinds of things like approve abortion and, and, and gay rights. I'm telling you folks, it's not that I'm crazy to compare it to the Third Reich during its early stages in Germany. The fact is the killing has already begun. In my state alone, we have had more gay men murdered in the last few months than I can even um, imagine. Let me go through some of them. In San Antonio, Charles Resendez, 38 years old, a gay teacher, beaten to death by a 19-year-old Marine private, beaten so mercilessly that footprints on his back were left. He was charged with voluntary manslaughter and released with 10 years probation, the man who killed him. In Houston, Paul Broussard, 27 years old, chased and murdered by 10 kids from McCullough High School in the Woodlands. They drove to Montrose area to beat up some queers, left five inch stab wounds in his right abdomen, stabbed in his chest, ribs were broken by knives, hit in testicles. John Bruce received a 10 year probationary sentence. In Midland, Texas, Tommy Muzak, a 48 year old hairstylist killed with four shotgun sh shots to the head, execution style by teenagers all given 12-year probation sentences. In El Paso, Joe Trevino, around February 1st of this year, brutally murdered in his home by kids, badly decomposed body. They're still simply languishing in the, in the adolescent home. Last two weeks ago, uh, June 22nd, two months ago, Paul Cantania from my little town was taken out of a bar in Dallas. His testicles were, were, were slashed, his throat was slashed, and he was stabbed to death 10 times in the chest. Let me tell you about Nicholas West. Nicholas was a 23-year-old Southern Baptist singer living in Tyler, a, a city near Dallas. He was just in the park one night talking to other gay men. There was not sexual acts going on. These were just gay, there's no bar, there's no church, there's no library, there's no gay and lesbian center in Tyler. They meet in that park. It was still daylight. He was kidnapped, his truck was burned, and I went to his trial to see what would happen to his murderer. And in that trial, four or five weeks ago in, in Kerrville, Texas, I saw that man laugh to the jury when he said that they scared Nicholas so badly that he defecated in his pants and roared, saying how often we like to make gay men urinate or defecate in their pants. It's a sign of their cowardice. And then when they began to shoot him, he put up his arms, and that's the picture you saw in the paper today of me saying that the bullet holes, so many bullet holes went through his arms and into his body that after 12, the coroner said he was still breathing because so much blood was in his lungs before they executed him through the brain. I went to that trial to make sure that at least one gay man was sitting there saying to the jury, please, gay and lesbian people may be off your list of approved, but they are not worthy of being murdered. And I sat there through that trial on the first day, the story came out in the Houston papers about the trial. And that same day, 29-year-old Michael Brzezinski, another gay man, was kidnapped, taken out of town, executed in the same style of the story of Nicholas West, and his car was burned in the same way, and the attorney of, the, the district attorney in, in that city said it was a copycat murder sure as you're shooting. And there it goes. The rhetoric, the rhetoric the rhetoric leads to death. The rhetoric leads to suffering. You don't have to believe in homosexual orientation. You don't have to say we're okay to be American citizens, but you have to stop the lying rhetoric because the rhetoric that says that we abuse and recruit and molest children is not true. Call any psychologist in this city and ask what is the source of child molestation. And every scientific study says that between 80 and 90 percent of child molestation comes directly out of the homes and families of those children that are abused. That from zero to three percent, say the studies, are homosexual molestations. We are not the source.
of cruelty to children. We have, for God's sakes, children of our own. We are your best elementary school teachers. We are your policemen. We are your pastors and your priests. We are your deacons. Imagine what would happen in Christendom if all the gay organists quit playing one Sunday morning. <laughs> we are everywhere. And we are doing our share to make this a great and responsible nation. I don't know if you saw 60 Minutes, but it ended with a quote that was edited. It made me so angry. I, I heard this. Did, you, did any of you see the 60 Minute spot? You and 35 million others. The last spot said, choose this. This is me. Who would choose this? I don't know anybody who would choose to be gay. Well, of course, you can imagine what all my gay and lesbian friends thought when they saw that on television. But Morley Safer had been tracking me for seven weeks. And we'd, you know, we were talking about the radical right and all the things they're saying and doing about us. And finally, he said to me, they say you people choose being gay. And I said, choose this? Who would choose this? I don't know anybody who would choose this. But once you know your sexual orientation, too, is a gift from God. Once you know that you can embrace and celebrate who you are as a creature of the loving Creator, once you know that it is not to be changed, nor can it be changed, once you know that, then you can live your life with dignity and with responsibility and with Christian faith, or Jewish faith, or no faith at all. They cut that part all off and just said, choose this. <laughs> Who would choose this? So I call up 60 Minutes and said, why did you do that to me? And they said, Mel, the people of this country need more than anything else to hear that this is not a choice. Because they think you're choosing this is a kind of a sexual aberration. And in fact, as a child, I never knew anything but same-sex attraction. As a teenager in high school, I was always in love with a football player and never in love with a Rose Festival princess. You can imagine how I felt when I was student body president and kissing in front of the entire student body the Rose Festival princess on the cheek and looking past her at the quarterback. <laughs> you can imagine how guilty I felt. I wasn't acting on any of that. But when the guys on my track team got together and talked about the beautiful girls and I was pretending to be interested in the discussion, it was miserable. That's why this whole Measure 13 thing that says, for example, just in its title, the Minority Status and Child Protection Act, there it is, that rhetoric that leads to death right at the top of the, of the amendment, Child Protection Act, as though Oregon's children need protection from us. It isn't true. And when you get down through that initiative, when you go down through that initiative and say, we can't even talk about sexual orientation, let alone domestic partnership issues, Oregon, please go in from the Lon May Bon edge and move into the sea of discussions we need to have about this great issue. Gary and I, Gary, my partner for 11 years, if he goes to the emergency ward, I can't even see him there unless his parents give me permission because I'm not next of kin. We can't own things together. He can't take what I leave him in my will unless some kind of crazy legal maneuvers are taken care of and we go through all these expensive procedures. We have no rights and yet we love each other and we're in a loving, committed, monogamous, caring relationship for almost a dozen years now. Seems like longer, I know. <laughs> People of Oregon, people of Oregon, I love you. You have always been to me heroic. From the first day I met Wayne Morris. Do any of you remember Wayne? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wayne Morris was a gadfly. All right, and we never agreed with him at least half the time. But I'd rather have Wayne Morris on a platform asking all those hard questions than all the rest of them sitting there and nodding and pretending those questions don't exist. That's what I learned from Portland. We are not afraid to ask the hard questions. That's what I love about this great state. We're conservative, but at the same time, we're open to new truth. This is the moment. Tom McCall, who was my friend at KGW TV and then went on to be governor, said, there's a fire burning at Eden's Gate. There's a new fire, Tom. I wish you were here to confront it. The new fire could 
burn across this country from Oregon, leaving death and destruction in its wake, or that fire could be extinguished here. If you look carefully at Amendment 13, you will see it too desperately needs to be defeated because its language, its essence, are discriminatory and lead to amending the venerable and historic Oregon Constitution to stand for injustice and discrimination. We were fasting last week, in last month, in Colorado in front of Jim Dobson's wonderful center there. Focus on the Family is a great our organization. Many of you know about Focus on the Family. But we've been monitoring Jim Dobson and Focus on the Family for two years at the cathedral. We have 78 people of our 12,000 just monitoring the radical right. Gary and I saw so much. They were saying that lesbians have 68 times the amount of tongue cancer, I mean tongue uh, uh, syphilis and gonorrhea of the throat. They were saying that 68% of all male teachers are apt to rape their elementary school students. They were talking about all of this crazy stuff on sexual practices that Lon Maybon and these people talk about. And so we went simply to fast. And we said to the people of Colorado Springs, look, you've heard all this stuff. If you want to meet a gay person or a lesbian person, come on up. Just talk to us and bring your children. And you know, even the newsman smiled when I said that into the television lens. From day one, the people of Colorado Springs began to walk up that hill bringing their children. We had to put up an awning with tables and Gatorade in the sun. There were so many families who wanted to show their children that gays and lesbian people are responsible, loving people too. They came up and they talked to us. Some of them came back day after day after day. And one of the moments that was so important to us, and on Yom Kippur weekend, it's so important for me to say this, a Jewish family came up and said, we're neither Christian, nor gay, but last time they took you first and we're going to see that it never happens again. God bless Oregon and the people of this great state. Our lives, our future, our hope, our living in dark closets is in your hands. Stand against Measure 13 and do a great justice for us all. Thank you, Dr. White, for that stirring presentation. Now it's time for questions from the audience, from uh, City Club members and members of Right to Privacy. If you would come to the microphone, as you see in the uh, forward part of the center part of the room, identify yourself by name and your association. And again, try to keep your questions, please, to about 30 seconds. We'll start with Diana Smiley. Dr. White, with all the inflammatory rhetoric being exchanged about this issue, how can those defending gay rights avoid being viewed as merely alarmist and sensationalist as a Lon Maybon might be, especially when the facts are not easily known by the average citizen? How can we avoid being inflammatory in this whole issue? Being viewed that way. How can we be, yeah, avoid being uh, viewed as inflammatory? Yeah, people say, Mel looks a lot like Chicken Little. You know, some piece of sky hit him on the head and he's running around. Uh, you have to remember that Isaac Newton also got hit on the head and came up with a very important concept that keeps us all to the earth. Um, I think it's very difficult not to sound alarmist because most of us are terribly alarmed, not simply by the rhetoric, anti-gay rhetoric, but we, we are alarmed by this notion that there is a group of people who should be imposing their strict 
view of morality on all the rest of us in a country that's dominated by First Amendment rights. And so this no longer is simply a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered issue. This has become an issue of concern to all Americans. At this moment, the Christian coalition is meeting. And they have 1,300,000 trained political activist volunteers. You can read about this meeting in the paper today in the Oregonian. I happen to know Pat Robertson intimately. And I happen to know that Ralph Reed and Pat have agreed that we won't talk about abortion and anti-gay rights anymore because we want to go mainstream. And in fact, there is a move across this country that's just as fundamentalist as the Iranian fundamentalist who took over the embassy in Tehran. And whether you're an Iranian fundamentalist Muslim or you're a Jewish fundamentalist shooting Muslims at the tomb of Abraham or you're a fundamentalist Christian shooting abortion doctors, this whole notion of the urge to purge is very frightening. I don't know how we can keep from being frightened or sounding frightened. But we mustn't raise the volume in the rhetoric. We must continually try to bring data, evidence. I really believe gay men are being murdered and lesbians are being murdered today because of this rhetoric. I can make a case for that if we had time. There's a one-to-one -one ratio. The rhetoric trickles down. When Jim Dobson wrote my letter against me a couple of weeks ago in Colorado Springs, he took a full-page ad out in the paper against me. And they read it over the news. And we were listening to the radio news a talk show, read that letter. And the first two callers, after hearing Dobson's letter against me, said, let's go up and kill him. That's the first two callers. So I wrote immediately to Dobson and said, if you don't think your rhetoric leads to death, we had two murder threats after your letter was read. So you see, even talking about this makes people crazy. And it sounds like I'm talking about Third Reich when these are good people. I believe that most of the people in the OCA are good Oregonians and are loving, loving folk. I think they just misunderstand. Craig Jackson has the second question. Dr. White, part of your story is familiar to virtually every gay man and lesbian, and that is the fear surrounding the decision to come out and be openly gay. October 11th is National Coming Out Day, a chance for closeted gays and lesbians to affirm their belief and live a life of integrity. For those folks still struggling with this fear of coming out, perhaps some are in the room today or listening on this broadcast, what message or word of hope would you give them? I am so excited about being alive right now. I'm 54. I never thought I'd get to be that old. But now I'm realizing that my life opened when I came out of that closet. I lost all my clients. It was hard. It's still very difficult. I'm volunteering at the Cathedral of Hope. We don't make any money. I'm still trying to b write books to make a living. But being poor and being rejected and all that stuff is a part of finding my own life. And once you find your own life, everything else pales into insignificance. Now, I tell you, more, many people would take a bigger risk than I am, and that's why I said I'm 52. If you were young and just starting out, or 54, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Gary laughed first. He's on guard. <laughs> I was 52 just a few weeks ago. <laughs> it's not going to cost me like it's going to cost these people who are at level entry jobs. Or what, look what it cost a person in the military. So, so even though it's difficult and dangerous and can be really financially inconvenient to say I am who I am, God created me, I'm going to accept that role in creation openly and lovingly, it is the beginning of life. So October 11th, see outside the closet. Paul Milius, club member. In the 200-plus uh, years and, and more of uh, history of this country, we have seen a variety of groups targeted uh, as being uh, worthy of prosecution, persecution, death. Uh, Jews, Catholics, Mormons, Quakers, blacks, Asians, various different times, different groups, different places. We seem to survive these things, and they go down in history as things that we all regret having seen happen. Is the anti-homosexual uh, campaign now underway somehow fundamentally different, or is it just uh, yet one more indication that in a society like this one, we will have periodically these waves of 
oppression against groups who are in every way innocent. I sense in your question not the attempt to minimize the waves either, but to say, is this another one? It's another one, and it, ha it has happened before, and hopefully uh, we will not see it very often in the future. Yeah, people say to me, uh, you think it's getting better or worse? And I say, it's getting better and it's getting worse. Because before it really gets better, I'm afraid it's going to be worse unless a lot of us take some very important stands, like in the Congress and in the courts and in the election booths across the country. But the Bible has been used, by the way, in all of those campaigns. You think back about how the Bible has been misused against Jews, against African Americans, manifest destiny against Native Americans. You go all the way back and you find that Copernicus and Galileo were put away under house arrest because they said the world isn't the center of the universe. The sun is, and the pope almost fell out of his window. He was so disturbed by that. And what followed there, and by the way, we Protestants remembered Martin Luther, Melanchthon, and John Calvin all excoriated Copernicus and Galileo because they, did, they were unbiblical. Last year, Pope John Paul II admitted to the world that 338 years ago, we were wrong the way we use the Bible. Gay and lesbian people can't wait that long. <laughs> Alan Oliver, City Club member. Uh, as a communicator, how do you deal with the no special rights argument? That's one of the trickiest um, issues. The, the very notion that gay or lesbian people want special rights is crazy. We don't want quotas. We don't want special um, affirmative actions. We, we only simply want to be recognized that we're being murdered out there. And, and Measure 9 says we can't even appeal to any level of government for redress or for justice. I mean, Measure 9, Measure 13 simply says, I keep mixing them up because they're so much alike. Uh, measure 13 says that, that basically you cannot appeal. So this very notion is, is just incredibly scary to me that um, we would be asking for special rights where in fact we would like to be included, for example, in, in, the, in the hate crime laws. We're not included there amongst all the other legitimate minorities, and yet we're the number one victim of hate crimes in many cities across America. Los Angeles County, for example, last year 26.8% of all hate crimes were committed were against gay men, and 22% were against African American men. For the first time in history, we've taken the dubious honor. So to, to say we want to be included as a minority under hate crimes, they think that's special rights. We are fired all across this country simply for saying we're gay. Not because we're illegitimate in the workforce, not because we don't do our job well, but simply because we might even be thought of as possibly being gay. Gary and I lost our apartment in Laguna Beach from a landlord who found out we were gay. And we were, he was fastidious in the upkeep of that apartment. We paid our rent ahead of time. I mean, we are a minority. We are being terribly persecuted in spite of all the rumors to the contrary, and all we want to be included in those areas that protect us from hate and from discrimination. So I, I say we want to be included, and if that's a special right, I'm sorry it isn't to me. We sure don't want quotas, all that stuff. Mel, welcome. Tony Grabler, C Club member and Right to Privacy member. I have a very simple question and you need to speak on his behalf or her behalf. If God were here today in the state of Oregon, what would he say to us about no on 13? I think God is here <laughs> and, uh, um, and I'm so grateful that God is here and that I think the Spirit of God always moves in mysterious ways through our brothers and our sisters. And as we listen to the evidence and we listen to the people making s cases from both sides, I think we'll hear God's voice. The only thing is, will we have the courage to act on it? When someone makes a queer joke and says in your office, he sure walks light in his shoes, will you have the courage to hear God say, tell him that's a homophobic remark and leads to suffering? When someone's fired or going to be fired because she's a lesbian, can you say to the boss, if she goes, we all go? You know, it seems to me that God is whispering in our ears all those things. The trouble is, it's not that he, she's not talking, it's that we're not listening. 
Fred Neal, club member. I'm engaged in fighting the Christian Rights Other Agenda item on Oregon's and Colorado's ballots this fall, this November, Measure 19, which authorizes city and county censorship. I'm interested in your analysis of those wider goals of the Christian coalition that I believe Ralph Freed was referring to when he said they were moving beyond abortion and gay rights. Uh, are, are they not trying to control city, county, school board, state, and federal policy bodies in such areas as wise use, quote unquote, of natural resources and uh, censorship? You wrote their speeches, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I wrote their books, yeah, and I wrote a few speeches, but I know them intimately. And again, if you think they're charlatans, you're wrong. They believe it. They're true believers, and that's really important to get through our brains. These are real, genuine folk who believe these things, that they need to censor the schools, that they need to, to put down gay and lesbian, that it's even okay to put an abortion doctor away, many of them. But, but let me tell you what they also believe. They believe in theocracy, not in democracy. And that means that their view of God should rule the nation. Pat Robertson has a university called Regent College. What is a regent? A regent is someone who reigns until the king returns. He's creating regents who will rule the nation until God returns, rule in the way he believes. They don't believe in the separation of church and state. They feel that that's a misnomer. They believe that the, ch that the state should be controlled by the church, their church. They don't believe in pluralism, the right to disagree and to go on as, as people who are safe and loving neighbors. And they don't believe in the Bill of Rights. Take the First Amendment, for example. Congress shall make no laws to establish religion. When they say we are a Christian country with moral absolutes, they are saying Christian fundamentalism their version and its ideology must prevail. So though I believe in their right to exercise their political muscle, I think we must see below the surfaces and realize that they are out to establish a theocracy and that it is a danger to every freedom-loving American. This is not a lesbian and gay issue. This is an issue that should have the whole country thoughtful. Susan Ward, a League member. What is it that you find in our, what is it in our society that makes us so susceptible then to this? Why do they think that they can change us from a democracy to a theocracy? I mean, there has to be something that's going on with us that is going to make this happen. There's two things going on. One that's going on with us and one that's going on with them. First, there's a kind of underlying belief, though, though even Pat Robertson will deny it, that Jesus is coming back in the year 2000. And that the scriptures are clear that we need to clean up the country so that Jesus can come back. So we have a lot of fundamentalists who are saying, if we can do, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, repent, and you know, clean up their foolish ways, there's this whole urge to purge notion that's really important to understand. They're trying to clean up the nation to bring in their theological event. That's one side. On the other side, this nation is afraid right now. We are a scared people. Financially, we're scared. Every day we get up and wonder if the stock market has crashed 500 more points. Every day we get up and wonder if we will have a job today. Every day we wonder if somebody will shoot our children in the public schools. Every day we get up and wonder what's going to happen. And if you live in California, you wonder if you're going to be there when you wake up. So, so that all of this insecurity, all of this unease says, we need someone who can clean up and ship up and shape up and make this country work again. And therefore, dictators and despots, fanatics and kooks and crazies and skinheads and neo-Nazis and white Aryan race pick up the guns and we're into another very dark time. Uh, program committee. Mel, you know, we have a strong initiative process in Oregon, and we, j in my opinion, had an astonishing abrogation of justice by the appellate court um, a couple of weeks ago when he they allowed the measure to go forth. 
I wonder if you would remark something about how different this argument would be if it were to remove the possibility of protecting the rights of persons who are divorced and remarried. Let's say Measure 13 tried to do, do to divorced and remarried people, for instance, what it does to gay people. Um, P.S. The Bible says a hell of a lot more about the immorality of that. They're called adulterers than what we do. You want to answer that? <laughs> Talk among yourselves. I think the question had within it a very interesting kind of uh, statement. We, we really, if you read that and substitute any other words, any other sin that you're guilty of, you might find yourself quaking like we're quaking. At the same time, if you go through the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., as I did, um, one of the guides knowing I was gay said, look, why don't you just substitute the word gay and lesbian every time you see Jew and see how far you get before you run out of similarities. And, and it, was, it was a terrifying thing. And I think that the clampdown will not simply be on gay and lesbians, but the clampdown will be on all the minorities, including Jews again. Did you see the full page ad in the New York Times taken out by a lot of Jewish rabbis and congregants saying we have nothing to fear from the religious right? It's an amazing piece of paper. Every place I go, Jews come up to me and say, it's happening again. Anti you know, the whole anti-Semitic thing is up in this country. We are having our synagogues painted with swastikas. African Americans are coming to me and say they're trying to separate us from, from each other, the African Americans and the gay and lesbian communities. Lou Sheldon said, the train that went to Seldom, Selma will not go on to Sodom. So, so, you know, trying to divide us and conquer us. But at the same time, as they're dividing us, conquering us, they're going to put us all away if they get into power. You find... African Americans in, position, in positions of prestige or power in the radical right. And I'll show you one or two talk show co-hosts. You find women in prominence in the radical right. And I'll show you Beverly LaHaye and Phyllis Schlafly who head up women's groups only. You show me Native Americans. You show me Pacific Islander or Asian Americans. I tell you, it's as racist and as sexist as it is homophobic. And we need to think about that. Now, that, that sounded ugly and unloving. <laughs> I just happen to believe it with all my heart. With regret, I'm asking a question that may be inhospitable because I it's time. agree with so much of what you say. I'm picking up on Fred Neal's uh, questions, which led to your comments about the dangers of theocracy, which were as eloquent as anything that I get from the national ACLU. I'm reminded that you wrote some of the speeches for the people who, to me, um, were obnoxious in their attacks on the, on the uh, uh, church-state separation. I'm asking you whether or not the change that took place within you um, because of your coming out, also changed your views on theocracy, or whether you had those views at the time you were defending, uh, uh, you were you were representing Pat Robertson. I'm interested in what happened to you as a person. That's a fair question and a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. You see, when I was working for the radical right, I believed that it was evil to be gay, and I was taking electric shock and I was eating alum pills and I was going through aversive therapy and reparative therapy and various kinds of reparities to get over it. So in terms of gayness, I never wrote against gay people. I wrote autobiographies, Jerry Falwell's autobiography, an historic book for Pat Robertson and this kind of thing. So I didn't, this sounds like rationalization that I'm trying to defend myself. I shouldn't have stayed as long as I did, but I really thought they were right. But they were fighting communism then. They weren't into becoming a theocratic government. They were against political and social action in those early days. Do you remember when we grew up in our Christian churches, the very notion of signing re voter registration in our lobbies of our churches would not be considered. And so the change that they made, as they changed to become so political, I immediately got out. Well, not as immediately as I should have. Mark Hatfield was a friend when he was governor and then when he was senator. And I watched Mark dealing with all of these evangelical brothers and sisters. And often when I would interview him, he would say, 
things that would give me clues that maybe I should be more careful, but I didn't take the clues. So now it's just changed. I mean, since 89, when the wall went down, the whole religious establishment has changed drastically. And, and if I have changed, I apologize for anybody I've misled, mea culpa, but I tell you, now I'm grateful for all of those influences in my life that said, keep watching so that you can change too if you need to. Time for one more question. Time for one more question. Gary? <laughs> Diana's got one yeah. more. Two. Dr. White, when you have the opportunity to counsel parents whose children have tentatively identified themselves as being gay or are working with it, what do you tell them? Now I tell them, you lucky folks, you got a gay one. And they say, <laughs> and I say, I talked to my mom and dad. When they heard that I was gay, my mom said, I'd rather have him dead. And my father said, on Fox Television Network, I think he's filled with a demon. Last two weeks ago, in San Francisco, they went to the PFLAG convention. Parents, friends, and families of lesbians and gays. And if you have a PFLAG organization in your town, that's the first thing I would tell a parent. Go to PFLAG. Let them take you through the shock. And then little by little, you'll see how beautiful and how wonderful it can be to have a gay child. And one other thing. So many of our people come out the same time they realize they have AIDS. And so the families don't have a chance to adjust before they have to act spontaneously and often cruelly. Do you know how many people who are, are dying in hospitals and in the parks with AIDS who have been kicked out of their homes and families because their folks discovered they were gay and said, you got what you deserve? I hope that that's not happening in Oregon. I hope that even if you don't understand your son or your daughter, that if she's there with breast cancer or if she's there with any other kind of malady or if your son has AIDS or another kind of disease, that while you're learning to understand, you will show the kind of Christian love that will make such an incredible difference during their last days. Thank you, Mel White. It's been a pleasure to have you with us today. We're adjourned. <laughs>